with the law. With your host, Lisa Speaker from Speaker Law Firm. Joining her today is Stephen Sinus from Sinus Dramus Law Firm. Amy Bailey from Bailey and Terranova Attorneys at Law. And Mary Chartier from Chartier Nyam Kukudza PLC. Now, let's discuss some remarkable stories and real cases. Welcome to In the Name of the Law. We're here today with a special episode regarding the COVID-19 crisis. I have a great group of attorneys with me today, Mary Chartier and Takura Nyampakutsa with the law firm of Chartier and Nyampakutsa. They are criminal defense attorneys. Erica uh, Terranova with the law firm of Bailey Terranova is a family law attorney. And Stephen Sinus is a personal injury attorney with the law firm of Sinus Dramus. Welcome everybody. And thank you for coming to me from your homes uh, for this special episode. Um, so every aspect of our society has been impacted by the coronavirus, and that includes our legal system. So we wanted to talk today about how the government shutdown and the coronavirus affects our legal system and, and the clients we represent. So let's start off by asking, uh, how has this affected your clients' cases? Mary? Well, as criminal defense lawyers, this has affected us in every single aspect of what we do. We had clients who had trials pendings, motion hearings, all those things have been put on hold. We're still preparing for trials, but we're just not in court. The biggest change has been clients who have been held in jail and we've been able to get released on bond because of the COVID crisis that's occurring in our jails and prisons. I don't know if anyone has been following, but especially the Michigan Department of Corrections has been hit very heavily, not just in terms of prisoners, but also in terms of the folks who work there. Uh, I think we're definitely gonna wanna talk about that some more as we um, progress in this episode. Um, Erica, can you share a little bit about family law and how it's been impacted? Oh, sure. Um, the, the same as Mary just mentioned, a lot of our hearings that were scheduled to ha deal with custody or child support or spouse support, parenting time, those have all been adjourned. The court is hearing emergency matters. Of course, they wanna make sure that, you know, we're always looking at what's in the best interest of the children and making sure that they're safe um, in, in what's going on with them right now. So what I'm limited to in the court system is, is only filing emergency matters at this point. Um, and the court is still hearing those matters in some form of, or another, whether it's by um, Zoom or phone or doing it by a written order. Thank you. Steve, what's happening in first entry cases? Yeah, so I think every area of law has been affected and every area has been affected differently. Uh, mine is more similar to Erica's in the sense that the court system really isn't there for um, to hear normal everyday issues. Trial dates have been adjourned. Um, so for my personal injury cases, for the cases that were pending, it's not that they've come to a complete halt, but they don't have the same momentum that they did before. And uh, that really affects how things go because without a trial date, the, the two parties don't feel the pressure of figuring out how to resolve their differences. So um, I am trying to find a way to still advance my clients' cases. Um, I understand why the courts are closed and it's certainly you know, justifiable given the situation, uh, but it is challenging to find a way to keep things going forward for them. So I know so far um, the trials in most cases have been pushed, although I have heard uh, from attorneys around the state that there are occasional judges who are willing to have an evidentiary hearing, which is basically a trial in front of a judge. Um, and some of those are gonna proceed to happen, um, but very, very limited, exactly what all three of you have mentioned. Uh, I have heard that there are still some hearings that are happening, but I think it's, in my experience, has been very um, inconsistent around the state. And it's really depending not only on the county, uh, and the courthouse, but at the particular judge that's assigned to the case. Have any of you four um, had an opportunity to do a remote um, hearing since the shutdown? Uh, actually, last week, we successfully argued for the release of our client who was in jail pre-trial. And I mean, I don't think it's news to anybody that jails and prisons are incubators of petri dishes, right? Because our clients cannot practice social distancing there. Often the conditions are not sanitary, and uh, but I mean those are not the only ways that our clients are impacted. Even the ones who are not in custody have been impacted. But yes, fortunately this judge was a very reasonable one, and um, within a couple of hours he was home with his family. That's good. And, and you did that by Zoom, right, yeah. Ticker? 
Yes, correct. <laughs> so business on the top, but you know, shorts on the bottom, right? Exactly right. <laughs> Steve or Erica? Yes, I haven't had anyone any hearing on my on my own cases, but my um, partners and associates have um, had a few cases so far, and they've been predominantly by Zoom, and that's how they're handling them. Um, I just had a, another case get adjourned today um, for May, and what my notice said is um, plan on participating by Zoom. So one way or the other, come the middle of May, we're having this hearing, and it's either going to be if everyone can appear again in court, or it's going to be by Zoom. So I think the courts now are starting to, to look to the future and say, well, we don't know what's going to happen next month, but why don't we prepare and, and be able to move some of these cases along? Because regardless, I do, I do know that's what the court needs to do and, and is trying to find a way to keep cases mm -hmm. moving along because they can't stay this way forever. Um, <laughs> Erica, did not law partners do a mediation by Zoom as well? Yes, they've been. Yes, isn't that? I know that that's interesting. And that kind of goes to what Steve said about without trial dates, that really is the way that clients feel, okay, let's get this settled. They get a little, little, uh, they want to settle a little bit more often when they know they have an upcoming hearing um, coming up. And so um, by doing that and keeping some of these mediations moving too, if everybody has the ability to do it, yes, we can do mediations by Zoom now. Um, and so with technology, we are able to keep some of those parts of the practice moving. And on that note, one thing I want to get out there is I think, you know, any human being who's experiencing this is, is um, experiencing something that they haven't really experienced before in terms of the impact in their life. And there is no date certain this is going to be over. And so I think the, the psychological mindset we all have inevitably is like a week to week mindset. And, and in the legal system, each week has been different. I mean, there was a few weeks ago where some judges didn't even indicate they thought this was a real problem. Um, it is a problem. You know, courthouses should not be uh, inundated with people and it, they should not go on as business as usual. But at the same time, how the legal system responds is something that we still are, are, are all trying to figure out. And I'm, I'm just trying to take it week by week because it's kind of overwhelming when you, you know, start to think about what if this, what if that. And then I think we all start to be resourceful as lawyers and try to find a way where, where we can. I think one of the things that all of us have realized, I, I just want to make sure, you know, the viewing audience understands that for attorneys, we are receiving um, new direction every day, whether it's from our local courthouses at the, at the county level, uh, or whether it's from the Michigan Supreme Court, which is governing all the trial courts in the state, um, and Mary and Takura, they do federal cases as well. Uh, obviously, governor's orders impact the practice, and so, uh, I, you know, I would love for any one of you to address the, what we're having to keep up with to, to be you know, up to date and current to best represent our clients uh, about what's actually happening because what happened yesterday is not gonna be the same tomorrow. Well, it's interesting. So you talked about federal. So Michigan is divided into two different federal districts, the Eastern and the Western. The Eastern essentially shut down significantly earlier than the Western. And then our appellate court is the Sixth Circuit in, in Cincinnati. So I had an oral argument scheduled and then I got the notice of that. And then we got a letter really soon after that that said it may be by phone or Zoom. And then we got the letter that said it's definitely by Zoom. So we had to keep updating the client about that. And then every, as you said, every single court and quite frankly, every single judge for a while was doing things differently. One judge would sh shut a courtroom down, the other one would have people elbow to elbow in it. So it's really been, to, to try and keep clients informed, that's been a real process because we need to make sure we're on top of things. And for courts, it's unprecedented. You know, I mean, it, it is really courts that don't have e-filing where you, you, know, you can submit something by fax or email have had to implement that really quickly. I mean, I, for court administrators to try and handle this issue, I do not envy them for a second. And I, I'll uh, go ahead, Erica. Sorry. Go ahead, Steve, and then I'll go. Well, I, I mean, just in terms of, you know, taking all these orders in and, and, and trying to understand everything that's going on and what your duties still are as an attorney, one thing I can talk about is that one of these orders that the Supreme Court uh, issued recently had to do with statute of limitations. And, and that's the timeline you have to file a lawsuit to protect your client's interest. And, and, in, and in my world, there are some short statute of limitations in the no fault insurance realm. It's about a one year rule that you have to deal with. And there are other you know, statutes that are short. And so 
and one thing I was wondering is as our law firm is going remote and, you know, people are going to try to do their best, but we knew the courthouses weren't, you know, necessarily operating the same way and how we're going to get everything figured out is what do we do about those statute of limitations? And I had a sigh of relief when the Supreme Court issued an order that basically told those statute of limitations during the state of emergency. So it's just an example of how there are these piecemeal things that have to go on to sort out all these legal rights that we all deal with in different courts and, you know, different systems and, and different concerns. And just to be clear, Steve, so if you had a potential suit that you hadn't filed yet and you were coming up against a deadline right now, that statutory deadline has been stopped so that you won't have to file until after the, the COVID crisis is over, until the courts are back in full operation. Is that right? Essentially, yes. Um, and and the, getting... you, still have, you still have the option to file if you, if you want to and you feel the need to, um, but, but it's essentially a tolling of, of the rule, yeah. And without getting too technical, is that apply to notice deadlines? I know there's really short deadlines in a lot of suits um, for injured people. Is, does that apply to the? the... Um, I, I, I'm going to say I think it does, but I'm also going to say here in terms of the viewers that I, they can't rely on what I'm saying about deadlines being actually told. I'm just using it as an example. They, it can get Fair tricky enough. depending on what you're dealing with. So. And Erica, we don't really have statutory deadlines right. in big law for the most part. There's very few things that are time limited except the courts wanting to process the cases within a certain number of days from the date of filing, which I, I'm suspecting. We haven't heard that the Supreme Court's gonna be a little bit more lenient when a case is not finished within one year like it normally is ought to be. Um, but anything you wanted to share about the deadline issue with the courts? Correct, family law is pretty much up in the air about what is happening with our deadlines. And we do have certain deadlines when a, when a proposed order comes out from front of the court, we have a certain number of days to object. For personal protection orders, um, there's certain days on both ends of when things need to be filed. So what I've been doing is um, is still meeting the deadlines. Um, you know, a lot of it has been doing by um, online, like Mary said. A lot of these courts who have never used online filing before are so. Thank you to the courts that are allowing us to do that. So I'm still meeting those deadlines. Um, as far as the statutory or the excuse me, the deadlines that the um, the Supreme Court wants cases finished by, yes, I'm sure they're probably going to extend those because there's only so much we can do to get those cases finished up. But at our office, we're just, um, you know, still meeting the deadlines with scheduling orders. Some courts are extending those and each court has it on their website. So um, we're doing our best to make sure that we're still meeting deadlines and meeting client expectations. And like um, Mary said, and Steve said, informing your clients that every court's a little bit different and it does go week by week and we're doing the best to keep everybody informed as we can. Thank you. And, you know, just so everybody knows, if, if you received a ruling from a trial court that you were, you were not happy with right before the shutdown, the Supreme Court also uh, suspended all appellate deadlines. So there's still more time to file an appeal by right if that was an option for you or whatever kind of deadlines, even briefing deadlines have been um, stopped in the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court now, our practice is to keep filing and do as much work as we possibly can. Um, and I'm pretty sure that the, the mm -hmm. model that all of you are using as well, um, but at least we know that we have, our clients have more time if they haven't been able to figure everything out. Now for criminal defense, it, you know, the, the deadline that I'm thinking of is that your clients are um, waiting for a trial. And like you said, somebody's in prison or in jail waiting for a trial, that means they're serving basically serving time without having been convicted of a crime. Um, could you talk a little bit more about those um, pretrial detention issues? So for state courts, as Takura said, they have been much more open at releasing individuals who are in the jail waiting for trial. Takura had great success along with another attorney at the firm last week. Federal courts have been uh, overall a lot more reluctant to release people who are waiting for trial. So while there's a speedy trial issue that's going on and we're still prepping for trials, and actually for us, you know, we're working from home, but we're able to get a lot of stuff done without having to travel to a court for another matter. But the, the concern is, um, you know, even if a court allowed a trial May 1st, are we going to be able to get a group of jurors who are going to be happy sitting in those chairs where they are not six feet away, but you know, probably about six inches away and sitting there? I mean, federal trials go on for weeks. And are, how are they going to really be able to focus on these very complicated cases? And the same with state court felonies. I mean, we have a trial coming up in June where we've got probably about close to 40 witnesses. This is going to take weeks and weeks. I don't know how a jury is going to feel about sitting for that at that point in time. I don't know 
you know, even if we'll be able to hold the trial then. And so it, there are a lot of facets that go into preparing for the case under regular circumstances. This adds a whole different layer that, you know, we all just have to work through. And, and if your client's out on bond, then it's not as much of a problem, right? But they don't, they're not going to mind as much having to wait a couple more months for trial. It's really the problem is when they're in, detained. I mean, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add something to Corey. Yes. So if somebody's home, it's better than them being in a jail cell, of course, waiting for trial. There's the stress and pressure that they feel, whether they're in jail or at home waiting for trial. But clients overwhelmingly, I mean, every single client we have is so understanding of the situation. I mean, they don't want to get sick. They don't want jurors to get sick. They, they understand the pressure that judges are under. I mean, we have not had a client who has been balking about the delays, recognizing it's out of everybody's hands. And as criminal defense lawyers, I don't know to correct me, uh, we're so used to like preparing for trial and then it gets adjourned for one reason or another. I mean, clients are really used to that. Uh, it's very rare that in federal court, you'll have a date certain, but in a lot of state courts, you won't, at least initially. Clients are used to waiting, unfortunately. And as long as they know that we are still working on their case and still out doing as much as we can, they recognize these are unprecedented times. I was just gonna add very quickly that there are, even before we get to the trial stage, uh, for felonies, for example, we have preliminary examinations, and depending on how complicated the issues are in the case, Darbert hearings, right, which is where we question expert witnesses. And in, in a hearing like that, there's some where I think there may be some, some room to have hearings via Zoom, but something that involves a, way, a lay witness, pardon me, absolutely not. I don't know. I don't want to have to trust that there's no one giving signals outside of the screenshot and you know writing things but um there are some things which i think still will continue but yeah preliminary examinations which if you were arraigned uh say the day before the, the governor's order we've gone way past that that amount of time that the courtroom says you have the right to demand your preliminary examination within and you know memories fade but right now, I don't think many people are traveling, so uh, we have a captive audience in, in terms of witnesses. But yeah, I think there are some things we'll be able to continue doing, but uh, anything involving a, way, a lay witness, I wouldn't be comfortable doing. So you bring up a good point, Takura, that I was going to ask Steve. Um, you know, the, the point that Takura makes, it really seems that it would apply to like a deposition in a personal injury case. If you're trying to take um, the deposition of a lay witness or a fact witness, uh, there's concerns if you're doing it by Zoom that you don't know who's in the room with that person, maybe passing the notes or whatever. There's just like, how do you protect the integrity of the system? Um, when, and have you done a remote deposition, I guess? So to respond to that, I kind of want to just go a little bit big picture here. Um, kind of going back to some of the things we we're talking about with the orders and just what the Supreme Court did. I just want to say this. I, I actually applaud the Supreme Court for acting decisively and the way they did. Um, they, they didn't, you know, there weren't any infighting there at the court. They all acted as a group. They issued those orders. They gave us guidance that really did have a real impact on how trial court judges had to operate. Um, I, I, I know it was a difficult situation for everybody, but there are a lot of trial court judges that weren't quite sure about what to do about the situation and maybe weren't taking corrective measures. So, um, it, relatively speaking, what the Supreme Court did, it really allowed us to, you know, reshape what we had to do to all stay safe and to keep people safe in general. Um, but getting back to your point and getting back to what everyone's been talking about, the, the experience I think I'm having at this point is, you know, maybe in all facets in life, but in terms of this profession as being a lawyer, this is the future that I maybe heard about in, in law school, or, you know, you thought about what would the future of law be like when it's no longer this in-person situation because of technology or just because of the way the system can function. Um, with the capabilities at hand. And now we've been forced into it. And it's all causing us to realize, or at least causing me to realize, you know, the in-person interaction basis of the practice of law, you know, whether it's serving papers on people, it's filing things in a, in a courthouse, having somebody actually go and do it, or, you know, really the, the mail system can sometimes do it. But if you need it filed, people take it down to the courthouse for you. If you have witnesses, you meet them in person to really see how they are, uh, whether it's privacy con uh, concerns over Zoom, or just the fact that you're not in the same room as them. It's a different experience. So 
this whole legal system is based on human interaction and how human action is, is fundamentally different. And, and I, I think it's going to cause, you know, a whole ripple effect in, in how this legal industry deals with cases and, and, and how we can proceed into the future. Um, as for your question, I've not done a remote deposition yet, in part because I don't really think it's the same thing as doing it in person. I know how to do it. I've done it in the past. If I had to. But on a couple of key cases of mine where I really want the deposition, I'd rather do it in person. But maybe I don't I'm not going to have a choice, you know, so um, everything is being reconsidered and reassessed. And to your point about the Supreme Court taking decisive action, I wanted to point out for our audience that our, our Michigan Supreme Court and the Michigan Court of Appeals are pre pretty cutting edge right now. Uh, the Court of Appeals held their first ever um, video oral argument last week. And the Michigan <laughs> <laughs> and I argued it, but that's fine. Uh, but the Michigan Supreme Court, even more significant, and, and I'm not involved with any of these cases, is holding um, Zoom arg arguments starting this week. And they're the Supreme Court's getting national attention uh, for taking that that leap. So I think that we should be pretty proud of our courts. Erica, I wanted to hear from you about some of the really the hot topics that your clients are questioning or you know worried about with their family law cases. Sure. Um, a couple of notes just to make that um, when I said emergencies is what the courts are dealing with, that means from a hearing perspective, you can still file for divorce. You can still file a new custody action. We can still do all those things right now. Um, like Steve said, we're, we're mailing it or doing it online instead of maybe filing something in person. But all of those things can still be filed, and that is that is um, business as 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 normal. But when it comes to the top topics, our parenting time exchanges. Um, you know, when the governor's first stay at home order went into place, it specifically dealt with what parents are supposed to do, and it said you still have to follow you know, exchanging your children, they still get to go to both parents. Now, that doesn't mean that that doesn't cause issues. So I'm finding issues right now of, um, do I still need to send um, the, ch the our children because my ex um, it has possible exposure to COVID, or is more likely to, maybe they work in the healthcare system, maybe they traveled from out of state or out of the country. So we're getting those issues. Um, the big common question is, well, my, our kids aren't um, in school anymore, so why don't we follow the summer parenting time mm -hmm. schedule? That's popular because a lot of parents go to week on week off during the summer, not everyone, but, but it's popular to do that. Right now, um, the courts are still saying, follow your order as if it was, you know, we're still in the school calendar, even though they're not going, we're not to summer yet. I don't know if that's gonna change. Like we said, we're, we're getting stuff on a weekly basis, but that's probably my biggest hot topic mm -hmm. um, parenting time issues that we're having right now. And another one I feel a lot of is child support modifications as well. When people have lost their jobs and they can't make the payments or that they're obligated to make. It's that is correct. And that is huge right now. I probably spoke to 10 people last week that that is, that is an issue. So we are um, still going to go ahead and file motions. Um, like I said, I don't know when the hearings will be though, or when they're going to do the, the child support reviews. So the order will still be going on. But if we at least get those motions filed, we can at least let the court know this is what happened. We need, we need to um, do something about these payments. But um, that is a very hot topic right now. And Mary Takura, what are the, the big topics for your clients? Other, you know, we've talked about pretrial detention already. Are there any other big topics uh, for your clients that they're having to deal with right now? Well, one of the biggest ones is for people who have been sentenced to prison, what about them? You know, they're in the Michigan Department of Corrections or they're in the Bureau of Prisons. Is there a way for them to get out earlier than what their release date would be? The Bureau of Prisons, which is uh, the federal, you know, that handles the federal uh, correction system, that has been really progressive about looking at people and releasing them earlier if they're at a particular point in their sentence. There's also compassionate release. I know they're overwhelmed right now. I, everyone's hoping that that's expanded a little bit more and, and people are looked at. But in Michigan, there isn't, we've got some sort of novel, I think, motions that we are doing. We've got some commutations we're working on um, for clients we, who we believe are deserving, and they also have some you know, medical issues. So that's going on right now. But if there's one thing that we take from this, I hope, it's looking at the parole process and really looking at, you know, if 10 years is enough, why are we sentencing someone to 15? If you know eight years is enough, why are we sentencing them to 10? I mean, we have people in there who really, I think, 
uh, by all, you know, everyone's viewpoint don't need to be in prison, yet there's not a vehicle for them to be released yet. And prisons are overwhelmed right now with the crisis. And one of the things that's interesting too, again, is it's the correction officers themselves. So when that outbreak comes through a prison, it's not just the prisoners, it's the people who work there, who then have to go home, potentially expose their family. I think a better way of looking at our prison system, how we sentence people, how people are released, I'm hoping comes from this crisis. And if I may add very quickly, is that most prisons, at least in Michigan, right, that's where we practice, so I can't speak to many other states, but most of these are in rural counties, right? And those workers, once they go home, uh, they are in communities where they don't have all the stuff. I mean, even in New York City, <laughs> right? I mean, over there, they have a lot more hospitals with what people thought would be sufficient um, you know, PPE and all of this, but in the rural counties, you know, whether you're in the upper peninsula or whatever the case, they just don't have the sort of resources that they need to be respond to this effectively. And if we can thin out uh, the number of people who are in custody, you know, whether it's at home confinement or whatever the case, then I think also it will have us thinking about people who enter into the criminal justice system in the first place. And that's why the work that the Michigan Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration, that's a mouthful. Um, a lot of the work that they were doing, I, I think, will mean a lot more and be at the forefront of discussions once this whole pandemic is over. Because there were people in custody who now I think we realize we really weren't scared of. You know, they just didn't have the money to pay for, for bond or whatever the case. But I, I think it'll impact. Um, the legal system in ways that we, we haven't even thought of. Right, thank I you. Just, Steve, I just wanted to make sure you had a chance if there are some issues that you wanted to share. I mean, there, there are plenty, but I just want you, the viewers to know this, that with, when it comes to insurance, the Department of Insurance and Financial Services is, is issued several orders. One says that insurance companies must continue to handle claims as best as they can, that they are essential and they have to stay in operation. So that's big for people who need their benefits and things like that. The other thing is, is that you might get a refund from your auto insurance company. The department has ordered that auto insurers just today, this happened on April 13th. Um, and, and so the Department of Insurance Financial Services said that auto insurance companies have to uh, determine whether or not they should issue a refund for the fact that there are so many more um, uh, or less claims, I should say, because so many less people are driving their vehicle. And so they've seen a huge drop in claims and they need to return some of that back to consumers. Oh, that's wonderful news. Thank you for letting us know. And again, this is just, again, cutting edge. Things are happening every day. We all have to work really hard to stay on top of it. Thank you so much, Mary, Takura, Erica, and Steve. Um, so great having you with us today. Thank you for joining us today for In the Name of the Law. Please go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics. And please join us next week for another informative show. watching in the name of the law. Please stay tuned to the WLAJ website for legal updates.